Hey everyone, here are my 10 GCSE physics exam secrets for 2024. Let's do this. Number one, do not leave your numerical answers as a fraction. If you are ever unsure, quote your answers to two decimal places. So you must quote all your answers to two decimal places unless the question states otherwise. So I'll give an example. So let's say for example you're given the following. The mass of an object is 10 kilograms and has a volume of 30 meters cubed. Calculate the density of the object. Well, hopefully you recognize that density is mass over volume. The density, the mass is 10 divided by 30, it should be a third. Do not leave it as a third, yes, nor do you leave it as 0.33333, who knows when you'll stop. You round it off to two decimal places, so there we go, 0.33. So do not leave it as a fraction. Tip two, if you are asked to describe the relationship of a graph in detail, ensure you talk about the rate of change as well as the general trend. So let's say, for example, you're given the following graph and you're asked to describe uh, the graph. First of all, yes, you can talk about the x and y axis. Yes, that as time increases, the counts per minute decreases. That's the first mark. But the second mark, guys, is going to be about the rate of change. So if you look between 0 and 2 at the start, it changes by 40. Yes, it ch changes by 40. But let's say later on we look between 6 and 8. Yes, it's still an interval of 2. It changes way less from, let's say, uh, 10 to, let's say, uh, f uh, 4 or 5 over here. So yes, um, look, for the second mark, we have to say that there is a greater rate of change at the start between 0 and 2 days, yes, because the count rate changes by 40 between there and there, then at the end, yes, between 6 and 8 days, for example, the count rate changes by less. So we must talk about the rate of change and see how it varies, yes, compared to the start and at the end. Three. Do not say environmentally friendly. Yes, you've got to be explicit. So I see this a lot in kids' answers. They always talk about the word environmentally friendly. Usually it's because they probably don't know what to put down, so they just whack that on there and they think that they'll get the mark. Right, so a good example would be the following. So let's say you asked about, um, uh, the question is, uh, why are people uh, against using coal power stations? Loads of kids will put down, they are not environmentally friendly. So no, you can't actually say this, you won't gain the mark, you actually have to be explicit. So actually be explicit in terms of your answers. So look, uh, a better answer would be, why are people ag against using coal power stations? Burning coal releases greenhouse gases which contribute to global warming. So there you go, over here, it's much more explicit than just saying it's not environmentally friendly. So the second one will gain you the mark, the first one won't. Tip number four. When talking about experiments, ensure you state the measuring instruments you are taking readings from. So I see this a lot in students' answers. They're writing up a practical, they're describing it in detail, but they miss out the measuring instrument. And I'll give an example. So over here, let's say an experiment uh, to measure the rate of cooling of a beaker of water. You say measure the temperature. Yes, so you measure the temperature. I know what you mean, you mean measure the temperature, uh, you know, from the thermometer, but you actually have to state that you have to use the thermometer. So you need to say measure the temperature of water using the thermometer, and there we go. So now we have included the measuring instrument in our plan. So make sure you don't lose that mark because you just failed to remember the measuring instrument. Five, if you're asked to use or find the gradient of a graph, make sure that you use a large triangle and you draw the triangle on the graph. So let's say, for example, you're given the following set of data. Let's say it's four specific extension. Yes, Hooke's law. And you're asked to work out the spring constant. Yes, that's going to be the gradient of the line because it's force divided by extension will give you spring constant. So look, the one on the left hand side, I've used a small triangle. No, guys, you shouldn't be using a small triangle. We're using a large triangle and I draw the triangle on the graph. So there we go. I've drawn a large triangle on the graph that will give me the mark. Six, ensure you know the difference between accuracy and precision. Right, so loads of kids think they know the difference between accuracy and precision. I'm just going to outline it very quickly over here. Right, so what does the word accuracy mean? So accuracy means how close your values are to the expected value. Okay, so it's how close your values are to the expected value. For example, let's say you know on Earth that the gravitational field strength is 10 newtons per kilogram. Okay, let's say you did an experiment, your value is 50. Yeah, that's what you worked out. Obviously, you are not accurate because you're not close to the expected value. But let's say your friend did an experiment or you did an experiment again and you got 10.2. Your results are accurate because they're close to the expected value. All right, so that's what accurate means. Um, what does the word precision mean or precise? Precise readings are readings which are close to each other. So that means that they are close to each other. So let's say, for example, uh, you did an experiment and you got the gravitational field strength to be 20.1, 20.2, and 20.3 over here. Right, so look, 
there's a small spread between the results. There's not much difference between them. 20.1 to 20.3, there's a small spread. And because there is a small spread between them, this means that they have high precision because they lie close to each other. So each of them lie close to each other. But look carefully, it's not close to 10. Yes, so it's not accurate, but they are precise. So these are precise uh, results, but they are not accurate because they are not close to the expected value of 10. Right, and over here, guys, this is low precision. So let's say, for example, you've got 30.1, 50.2, and 70.4. Look carefully at this. There's a large difference between them. There is a large difference between them. So they are not precise, yes? Or you can say they're low precision. So there you go. So these are low precision over here. And they are also not accurate because they're not close to the expected value of 10 newtons per kilogram. Seven, if you are asked to prove direct or inverse proportionality from a set of data or a graph, you need to work at the constant. So this question has come up a couple of times. Um, they gave a graph. Uh, the graph is a graph of intensity on the y-axis and light on the x-axis over here. We can see that they are directly proportional right now. If you're asked to prove if it's directly proportional, you must find the constant at multiple points. So at multiple points, you find the constant. So you know that intensity is proportional to the light. Therefore, intensity is equal to a constant times by uh, the light. Therefore, I found the constant at different points. Yes, very similar in terms of mathematics. Uh, y is proportional to x, therefore y is equal to kx. We find the constant at multiple points, and the constant should be the same at each point over here. If you're still struggling in this concept, if you click on the video below, it will have a detailed explanation of this topic about proving proportionality. What about inverse proportionality? So if it's inversely proportional, we can see that we must also find the constant. So look, in this one, I've got a graph of acceleration versus mass. Acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. Therefore, in order to prove this, I must find the constant. So look, I'm going to take values of the acceleration. I times it by the mass, and I'll be working out the constant at different points. There, there, and there. And yes, look, the constant will be the same each time. 200, 200, 200 for all these different ones. And once again, in that video, I walk you through this uh, example here. So check it out, guys, if you're still struggling. Eight, make sure that you understand what the term resolution means. So make sure you understand what the term resolution means. Right, so let's say uh, we're given two rulers over here. So here's the first ruler and here's the second one. Right, so what is the resolution? The resolution is simply the smallest measurement you could make on that measuring instrument. That's the simplest way that I like to uh, talk about it. So over here, look. This one is one centimeter, but the smallest measurement I could make would be one millimeter. Yes, one millimeter or 0.1 centimeters. So um, look, ruler A has a resolution of 0.1. But let's say I've got ruler B over here. This one, you can see that, look, it's only per centimeter. There's no millimeters here. So this one has only a resolution of one centimeter. And obviously, which ruler is going to be the better option? It would be ruler A. Yes, the reason why it has a higher resolution compared to this one over here. Yes, so this one measures to the nearest centimetre, the one above to the nearest millimetre. Nine, ensure that you understand how to calculate uncertainties. In order to calculate the uncertainty, all you've got to use is the following expression. It is the maximum value in your range of results minus the minimum value divided by two. So I'll walk you through one example. Let's say you do an experiment, you've got the following answers, 12.01, 12.05, and 12.07. The uncertainty will be the maximum value minus the minimum value divided by two. So 12.07 minus 12.01, yes, divided by two. So there we go, it becomes 0.06, yes, at the top, yes, divided by two. So yes, the uncertainty will be plus or minus 0.03. Make sure you can use that formula because it will not be given to you. Next one, number 10, learn all the prefixes. So prefixes, guys, they're used uh, for looking at different quantities. So these are the ones you should know. We will start off at the bottom, nano, n, it's going to be times 10 to the minus nine, micro, mu, times 10 to the minus six, milli, uh, lowercase m, times 10 to the minus three, centi, uh, c, times 10 to the minus two, kilo, k, times 10 to the power three, mega, capital M, times 10 to the power six, giga, uh, capital G times 10 to the power of 9, Terra, capital T times 10 to the power of 12. Yes, make sure you can use all of them. Yes, don't forget uh, you need to use them in your calculations. Some of the formulas, you must get rid of the prefixes before you actually whack them in to get your result. Okay, so let's look at an example. 4 times by 10 to the power of 3, capital M, capital T is the same as what? Right. Okay, so first of all, capital M stands for mega, so I'm going to replace uh, the mega over here with times 10 to the power of 6. Therefore, it's 4 times by 10 to the power of 3 
times by 10 to the power 6. T stands for Tesla, so that is going to be the unit. Yes, this is the prefix, this is the unit over here. So therefore it becomes 4 times by 10 to the power of 9. Yes, the power of indices in mathematics. And that's it guys for another session of Sarazzle Dazzle Physics. Make sure that you like and subscribe to keep my channel going. Comment below if you think I've missed anything out and I'll do my best to answer all your queries. Ciao, ciao and goodbye.